Aloha and good morning to this morning's service. Um, thank you for coming this morning. We um, very appreciate your worship, worshiping with us this morning. Okay, I am Virg Pacific. I will be your day reader for this morning. Uh, this morning, our uh, altar flowers are from Marie Galicinal as we celebrate her birthday. And also, um, presiding in um, this morning's worship. Is um, Pastor Dan and Riddle, and also um, the prelude by Pastor um, Kendall. Mm -hmm.
exciting to be here because um, this is a room full of love. This is a holy place with amazing music. So let's give a hand up hallelujah for all the music shows. And we want to die from our, our young people. Which leads me to this moment in time in our worship service for those of you who are children and those of us who are young at heart. So I had a little scrape in a cut. Perhaps if you're at home and you're watching your little child here at Young at Heart, that's happened to you before. And so if you're young, you go to your mom or your dad and they help you find a band-aid. That band-aid already. Sometimes you get hurt. I bet if you were here, if you were up here with me, you'd be able to tell me all the different times that you've gotten hurt. Maybe times when you've fallen off your bike, maybe times that you fell running, maybe when you were learning to ride a bike, maybe, maybe when you were fishing, could have been a time you got hurt at school that you needed a band-aid. So you went to a parent or an adult or a counselor at school, you got that band-aid and they helped you and on you just like that, and it would start to heal. And as I asked Neil where those band aids were today, I thought about how some things in life just can't be fixed by band aids. If you're a child today watching, if you're here at home, sometimes friends hurt our feelings that can't be fixed by a band aid. And, 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 Sometimes our parents tell us to go to bed earlier than we want to. <sighs> that can't be fixed by bed day. And sometimes we have more homework than we would like to have, and we're upset. It can even make us cry. Yes, I know that one. And that can't be fixed by a bed day. Sometimes someone in our family gets sick and even dies, and that can't be fixed by bed. And for both the things that can't be fixed by band-aids in life and for those things that can't be fixed by band-aids, when we experience them, children and those young at heart, we need God. We need God then. And, and I want to remind you today, both the children here and the young at heart, that any time you can talk to God, and that's whether it's a situation where your mom can put a band-aid on you and that will fix it, or a situation where a band-aid won't fix it. And you're worried about getting your homework done. Or you're worried about your auntie gets sick. Or you're worried about having to go back to school. Or you're worried about this or that. You can talk to your parents, but you can also ask God in prayer to help you through that. So I wanted to remind you today, both children and those young at heart, that there are just some things in life that band day can't fix. We can talk to both our parents about those things and the adults in our lives. But the one person, the one thing that's going to understand everything is God. And that's who we go to for those things that a band-aid won't fix. So the next time you're worried or you're scared about something that a band-aid won't fix, then gather your mom or your dad up with you and just get down on your knees beside your bed and ask God to help you. You will hear a voice answer like you'll hear your parents' voice answer. But that's where our faith steps in. And we believe that when we pray, God hears our prayers and acts on our behalf. Acts for us, makes it better. So let's pray together. Dear God, we're thankful for band-aids and we're thankful for mommies and daddies that put band-aids on us. We're thankful, God, that sometimes there are things in life that a band-aid won't fix. When our feelings get hurt, and when we're worried, and when we lose something. We're thankful, God, that we can get on our knees beside our bed, or anywhere that we're at, even in the school lunchroom, and we can ask for your help, God. Thank you for always being there with us. Thank you for being our great healer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we offer up special prayers for the Hughes family. Um, part of them are moving back to the mainland, so there's new beginnings there. And then also for some unspoken personal prayers then for that family as well. So this, this week and in this next few weeks, I hope that you'll keep your heart 
tune into that family and, and lift up prayers for new beginnings and prayers for even for the unspoken prayer that they've asked for. Let us pray. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord. Come to you hungry and thirsty, hungry for the true bread of life, thirsty for your living water, hungry for hope and, and new beginnings and, and even certainty. Thirsty. Thirsty for your love and your grace and your mercy. mercy. Thirsty for your great healing, God, for whatever is broken or eternal, or worried and concerned and anxious within us. We come for your balm and Gilead, the anointing that only you can give us, God, of the peace that passes all understanding. This morning in our minds, God, we picture those the hills behind us, those mountains behind us, and your word tells us to look to them for where our help comes from. And we know, God, that you are both there and here. You are in nature and all things beautiful. And you are making all things beautiful in your time. Help us in this first Sunday in Lent and as we begin this Lent journey, God, to come to you for our bread, to come to you for the living water, to lay down our burdens at your feet, to lay down all that is within us that is not a part of your purpose in this season in our lives. To open ourselves into your loving gaze, into your hands that create all things new. Living God, shape us and mold us into all that you would want us to become and to be and to journey forth through this Lenten season as we are on our way to Easter Sunday. Hold us now, God, in the palm of your hand. May we be the apple of your eye. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's letter. Scripture lesson from the Old Testament is from Genesis 3, verse 19. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for thus you are, and to dust you will return. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from Luke 18, verses 9 to 43, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one of one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home satisfied before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the good news. Praise be to you. Let us pray. Dear God, as we share your word this morning, I ask that you intervene. And, and for each heart that's here and each soul that's here, that you shape those words, that you shape the meaning of this text, and what you would have each ear hear this morning. 
that you shape it and you mold it so that it's understand clearly by understood clearly by each person here. And just the way that they need to hear it dependence upon their souls, their heart, their life experiences, and their age. You know, each one of us kind of the last year on our head. So we give this moment to you and to your shaping with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was in high school, one evening, I grew up in a small town in Texas. And um, from our home, we could hear all of the sirens. And so, in a small town like that, when you hear a lot of sirens, you're worried that it's someone that you know. So, we got in our car, and the accident scene wasn't very far from my house. So, when we got there, we, we saw an incredible accident. And as we stood there watching, it was dark, and so I couldn't recognize the two cars exactly. But I watched him from one of the cars where a man got out of the car, and for a moment he stood up, and I recognized him as my neighbor. And for a moment he stood up, and to the EMTs that were rushing towards him, he said, Nothing's wrong with me. I'm okay. And he breathed his last breath and collapsed. I thought about that ever since that night. And how often everything on the outside can look like we're okay. There was no blood on him. There were no cuts that, that one could see. And I thought about it when I have everything on the outside of us can look just fine. We're okay. There's nothing wrong. But on the inside of us, we're bleeding, broken, we're dying, we're hurting. I carried that picture with me for so long because I thought about how many times people say, how are you today? And, that, and we say, I'm okay. Well, that is anything but the truth. You know, I can tell you, you know, especially husbands, if you say to your wife, honey, how are you? And she says, I'm okay. That is code language for something that's about to go down. And pretty soon. For many of our friends, when we ask them how they're doing, they say, I'm okay, I'm just fine. Those are real tricky words. I'm fine because no one's ever fine. And so, so often in life, we look okay on the outside of our bodies. Our life might even look okay to an observer. But really, there's some kind of hurt, a loss, or breaking, even bleeding going on metaphorically on the inside. So I carried that story and that picture of that night into this Bible verse, my entire life, this text. That's how the Bible comes to life in our lives, through our experiences and in reading the Bible, our experiences then as we read through it, everything's transformed. The story of the Bible becomes a living story that just erupts inside of us and we have to share it. So that's where I'm at this morning. I have to share this. And so I think about that story and I think about our Bible story from the gospel this morning. And how in it we have in a temple, in a, in a church like today, we have two different men that it talks about. One is a Pharisee and one is a tax collector. And I, I picture the Pharisee up in front of the church. And it's like, it's like he's really strutting his stuff in front of the Almighty God. I mean, he's like providing his resume for the creator of the earth, as if the creator of the earth doesn't know that. He is up there, I mean, he is walking with some swag, and, and he is proclaiming to God, I'm okay. In fact, I'm more than okay, because I am fasting more than twice a week, and I am giving 10% of my money to those who need it, to the poor. I mean, he's bragging to the Almighty God who can do anything. He's telling God what he has done 
to make himself right with God. And to talk it all like, kind of like icing on a birthday cake, he says, and after all, thank goodness I'm not like those people. Those tax collectors, those bad people, those people that don't have it together as good as I do. And then there's this other man standing in that temple in that church. And I picture him at the back of the church. And he can hardly lift his head up. The Bible says that he can't, he can't even lift his head up to look towards God. And instead of all of that, he just cries out, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Just say that when you are right now, Jesus. Lord, have mercy on me. Now, those are two very different pictures of following the way of Christ and the journey of Lent. We have the Pharisee who's proclaiming to God all that he's done to fix himself. And then we have the tax collector who was, tax collectors in that day were hated by people. They skimmed off the taxes. They took up more taxes than the Roman government called for. They skimmed off the top of them. They bribed them. They did everything to the people. They were hated in those times. And then we have the picture of the tax collector. You can't even lift his head. And he's saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's saying, Lord, I can't fix myself. And we have a lot in common. In fact, we have everything in common with that tax collector because there is not a soul here of any age in this room or beyond this wall, these walls are on this earth that can fix themselves. And so, so in this picture of Lent, we have the tax collector as our example. We have this journey to Easter where we can cry out to God, God, I can't fix myself. I can't fix this situation. I can't fix this thing I'm involved in. I can't fix this family of mine. I can't fix this habit that I have. I can't fix where my attention is. I can't fix this depression. I can't fix this need for this or that. I can't fix this hopelessness. I can't fix this uncertainty. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we have the Pharisee who I pictured up in front who proclaims to God all that he has done to make himself right with God. We have the tax collector who knows there's nothing that he on his own can do to make himself right with God. So while the Pharisee tells God all that he has done to make himself right with God. The tax collector is opening himself up for what God will do within him to make himself right with God. You see, when we can't fix ourselves, and we can never fix ourselves, we turn to God and we don't pronounce all that we've done because our acts will not make us right with God. Our acts won't fix things. No matter how many wonderful things that we do, that will not fix ourselves. It's only what God does within us that begins the healing and ultimately fixes us for eternal life. One man in this story focuses on what he has done. The other man, the tax collector, focuses on what God can do. Do with your mask. It's okay. It not be okay. Now, sometimes we need to especially have that heard by families and said to families so that they're on the same page as us. So I want you to turn to someone and just with your mask on say, It's okay to not be okay. Go. Now, turn to someone else and say, It's okay to not be okay. You know, we live, we live in a world where we're supposed to keep it all together, amen? Where everything really is supposed to be okay. He said, you haven't figured this out yet as you've gotten older from child age into adult age. 
You probably already figured this out if you're a teenager. When people ask you how are they doing, they do not want to hear all that's wrong with you. Have you figured that out? That's why I think we so often say, I'm good, I'm fine, nothing's wrong with me. And so this, this earthly life has taught us to act like we have it all together. It, it's taught us to, in this belief that, that if we just work hard enough and we just do enough and we do enough good, things will work out. The Titanic will by itself. We don't want to be honest and real when life crashes into us and we have a bill we can't pay. When life crashes into us and a relationship dissolves, when life crashes into us and we're going to have to sit by ourselves on the bus during the field trip, when life crashes into us and we hear the words, I don't love you anymore, when life crashes into us and someone whom we stake our entire life upon disappoints us, when life crashes into us and we lose someone that we love, when life crashes into us and we get the doctor's report we never ever wanted to have. We don't even want to say then, I'm not okay, I can't fix myself. When we find ourselves in, in, in the wreckage of in the wreckage of the divorce, in the wreckage of our entire life turning upside down, in, in the wreckage of losing a job we love, in the, in the wreckage of a dream not coming true, in the wreckage of not getting into the university or college that we wanted to, in the wreckage of looking at an exam and thinking, that's not the grade I thought I was going to get. In the wreckage of our parents fussing and fighting, in the wreckage of worrying about one of our children who isn't healthy, maybe they've got a, a learning disorder or something going on, we're not sure about it. Even in the midst of that wreckage in life, it's still hard to say, I'm not okay. I can't fix myself. And even when the paramedics arrive and, and we're hurting so badly on the inside, this is all metaphorically, and we're bleeding and we're broken and we've taken all that we can. Even then, as the metaphorical pyramids of life rush up to us, that would be our friends and our church family and those that we work with, our mom, our dad. Even when they rush up to us, we're still often tempted and still say, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. I'm okay. Even then, it's difficult to admit that we're not okay. And so we're entering this amazing season of Lent where what if, what if, what if, and you just lay it down. All that you can't fix, all that you can't be, all that you don't have, and all that isn't working out and didn't work out, all that you've lost. How do you just? Lay it down and lean into God's faithfulness. Lean into God's healing. Lean into God's new beginnings. Lean into God beginning a work on you and me from the inside out. What if today you just say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner? You let God be God within you. And we're a little reluctant about that sometimes because that usually means some loss, some giving up. Because anytime God works on us and reshapes things within us and starts moving things around, it means that there's a habit we might have to give up. It means that there's a way or a behavior, a way that we act or a behavior that we might have to give up. It could be as simple as not going home and eating candy after school to going home and changing your behavior of the way that you relax into reading the Bible each day. Then is a time where we can lay it down and let God be God within us and be honest and say, God, I can't fix this. Have mercy on me. And it's also a time to say, in this season, God, crucify anything within you that's not for your purposes, that's not for your purposes in this season or in eternity. And that's where it gets 
or change. You know, I want to give you an example of what happened to me, because it's the best example that I had to go along with real life and to make the Bible come to life. So, this would be an example of how God crucifies things within us. And this is all metaphorically, okay? So, about a decade or so ago, I was in a terrible, terrible car accident. I mean, an awful car accident. On ice and snow, much like what you've been reading about the main one. It was a terrible winter. The car wreck wasn't my fault. And the car wreck left me in a wheelchair for six months. Broken feet, broken hands, frostbite because I laid there for two hours in the ice and snow. It was a game changer. It was a life changer. Before that accident happened, I had been going at the church I was serving at as a pastor. I had been going through the neighborhoods around the church, and we had started what we called this porch ministry. That meant we didn't go into people's homes or anything or disturb them or make them uncomfortable in that way. We just stood on their porch, and we just talked to them. We just talked to them about life. They were pushing the trash can out. We talked to them about life, and we always asked them, was there anything that we could pray for with them? In the middle of that, I had met this young woman named Jennifer in some apartments that were mostly designed for mothers that were single mothers with children who were really having to work hard in life. And so through meeting her, I had developed this friendship. That was where, with Jennifer, I learned that you don't do ministry to people, you do ministry with people. I learned more from Jennifer than I could have ever have taught her. And after this accident, when I could finally kind of get out, we went with some other ladies from the church to a restaurant to eat. I'm in my wheelchair, oh poor woman, well, because uh, it was about six months later. And we were talking, and I, I said to the group, I'm just so worried. Now, keep in mind, I had probably like Edward, where's Edward? I had been playing the piano since I was three years old. It's like piano, music, singing, all that was in my DNA. I still had both my hands in cast. The doctors had told me they didn't know how all of that would come out. So I'm sitting there, and I, they were asking me how I'm doing, and I just burst into tears, and I say, I don't know, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to play the piano again. And this is where the crucifixion came. And this young woman named Jennifer, she looked at me, and she said, Oh, but Pastor Man, your ministry is not in your hands. Your ministry is in your heart. God's kingdom began to rise there. I felt the water on my ankles coming up my knees. I have never looked at God's purposes for my life the same since that moment. But something had to be crucified in that moment. And it was my, my, my pride and my ego and my identity about how good of a musician that I was. And my identity as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ has been within simply my musical capability. In that moment, God crucified that. And God crucifies things like that within us in order for us to better serve God. We're going to be happier, not sad. We're going to have more, not less, because of that. We are not giving up something. We are giving it to God. I was thinking of examples this morning of what God could be crucifying in some of us right now. And I, in that example, I, would, I had built kind of my kingdom on music. I was serving God through music, but I had really purely built my kingdom on music, not God's kingdom. And I thought about this morning like, hmm, what today might God want to be crucifying within me, maybe many other people? And I sat there and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and it hit me. Right now, I am longing for a kingdom of certainty. I want to know when I don't have to wear this dress again. I want to know that in X amount of time, we're going to all be able to sing without masks. We're going to be able to sit close together. I want a kingdom of certainty. I want to know when all the kids need to go back to school. I want to know when we can hug again. I want to know that on Easter Sunday, every family here and across the globe can 
gather together in whatever numbers they want without the fear of pinching the virus. And what has God done to that kingdom and, and that desire? Slowly, over a year, God has crucified that, that need for certainty. Oh, it's still there. But now I have my eyes open to different things. Like I'm watching this church, the way that you've invested both time and people and love into reaching people beyond these walls via having it televised and on Facebook Live. I look at the resilience and the way that God is working through you all in other churches towards new beginnings and the way that God is showing you what you need to leave behind and what you need to bring forward. Because we all sense, probably more than any other time in our life, something new, something different is on the horizon. We just don't know what it is. And so slowly, one by one, each one of us, even though we didn't necessarily ask for it, God has been crucifying this need for certainty within us. This need to have a kingdom of certainty that we were operating in. And that shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because if God is anything, God is mystery. God is the new life that takes a bulb, like the tuberose inside of the ground, and is shaping it for flowering, even by right now, under the earth, when we can't yet see that flower on the plant. The entire Bible lifts up how God is a God of mystery. The certainty is that God is, is that God is love, that God is always present, that we are God's children. We have those certainties and those truths that God that never changes. But about this day-to-day -day life in a virus, we have to remember that our God is making all things new and that God takes ashes and creates something beautiful. So as I thought about it, I prayed about that this morning, I thought, oh, for a whole year, God has slowly been crucifying the need for certainty in my heart. I can tell you when this does all end, and whatever that new beginning is, because we won't go back to the same thing, because a God creating all things new doesn't operate in reverse. Whatever that new is, I'm going to be a new person when I get there. Because God has removed some things from me, mainly that need for certainty. And I'm going to look at God's mystery and God's birthing and God's creating in a whole different way. What happened if, what would happen if today you just chose to lay it down? That need to say, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. That need to proclaim to God all that you've done and the good things that you've done. And just stand there and say, I can't fix myself. Just be honest. I can't fix myself. And rather than what I want and the kingdoms that I would love to see rising up in me and in my life, God, Crucify what's not needed within me anymore and let your kingdom rise within me. I often wonder if we, if we kind of had this idea that we'll get to heaven and we'll say, Look, God, I made it. And we expect to make it without any holes in our hands or holes in our feet. When daily, the Bible tells us, that God crucifies within us what is necessary for God's kingdom. We share this with every person across the globe. No matter what their theology is, no matter what church they go to or don't go to, no matter what they believe, we share this. We share this with every person across the globe because there is no one in this earthly life that can fix themselves. There's only so much they can do. So what if you lay it down? You lay it down at the foot of this cross where everyone is equal because no one can fix themselves? What if you lay it down here? What if you lay it down when you get home in your bedroom or the place that you do your devotions? What if you stand beside the ocean today, wherever speaks to your soul? 
And you lay it down. And you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you lean into God's faithfulness, God's mystery, God's understanding, God's capability, God's perspective on this situation. And what if you stretch out your arms? And you tell God, I'm yours. Take out what's not needed for your kingdom. Replace it with you, God. Replace it, make me all things new within me. Fill me with your love. Let your kingdoms rise within me. And in this world, let's pray. Dear God, give us the spiritual boldness to lay down our need to be in control, our, our, our need to be okay, our need to look like we've got it all together, God. Help us to lay that down at your feet. Help us to lay down the belief that we have that in part, and that in some ways we can fix ourselves if we just do this or this or this. Help us to lay down the desire to do good things simply to be able to proclaim that we've got it together. To pat ourselves on the back, to stroke our own pride and our ego pride. Take from us, crucify within us what is not of your love, what is not of your kingdom come, what is not of your kingdom of generosity, what is not of your kingdom of compassion, what is not meant for this season in our lives, God, for both the individuals here in this church. Help us to stretch out our arms and let you crucify through this Lenten season that that which you don't need for your purposes. We can't do that on our own, God, so we ask that the Holy Spirit work through us to surrender ourselves to you, God. And that your kingdom rise. Whatever that looks like in each one of our lives, in this church, and in this place, and in this moment. And that your kingdom come as we pray in the Lord's prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. I asked two of our young people today to share a song with you that just really, sometimes words can, words can speak, but music speaks stronger. And so a couple of our, we have so many talented young people here. A couple of those are going to come up and, just a couple of the young ladies are going to come up and share a song with you that I think just wraps this all up in a way that my words can't do. Thank you. 
here. Thank you. At this time, um, we have our voice button. Um, what we ask you, please come forward. Some in my family in Texas who are literally fighting it on their own, like only one person fighting it and fighting for what they need, God. And we ask that you intervene and that you send people to intervene and to make a way for them, especially for this family that put up this morning, God. We ask for you to make a way where there may seem like there is no way. But you are the miracle worker, God. Take our gifts today and work miracles. In Jesus' name, we offer them. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brittany Prashad Almeida. Um, I'm a former recipient of the scholarship, and also I'm part of the scholarship committee, along with Jason Oxelda, Michelle and Alex Geisai, and Melissa and Alex Garcia. Um, so we are very excited to be able to present this scholarship today. Um, we didn't think we would be able to give a scholarship this year, but as usual, God always provides, so um, we're <clears throat> very blessed to give it today. 
Um, so a little background information on the scholarship. Um, this scholarship is to honor Sharon Gavaccio. Um, he passed away at a young age, at the age of 21. Um, I was really, really young when he passed away, but from what I hear from other people's stories, um, I know that he was a scholar and he served the Lord and he loved the Lord and everybody loved him too. So, <clears throat> so this is a perfect scholarship to be able to share with um, our young people. Um, before we move on to honoring the recipients, I wanted to take some time to honor generous donors of the scholarship who passed away within um, this past year. Um, the first person we wanted to honor was Auntie Audrey Parkouz. She was a generous, scholars, a generous donor to the scholarship. And um, unfortunately, her daughter Leanne couldn't be here today. Um, but we wanted to thank her for everything she's done. <clears throat> and then um, also we wanted to honor Uncle Domingo who passed away last year. Um, he loved the golf tournament and he always contributed. And um, big answer Maria, can you stand so we can, we can honor him through you? You know that they're both looking down from heaven on us and very happy with um, the recipients that we have this year. Okay, um, so I love being part of this committee because I, I'm a teacher, so I'm around young people all day and I love watching the growth of young people. Um, so I, I really enjoy reading the essays that they write. It's so heartwarming. I love you Sundays. And thank you, Casey and Erica. That was very beautiful and heartwarming. I'm like a softie and crybaby for young people, so yeah. Um, anyways, what I wanted to do now is to take the time to recognize the recipients. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna we're gonna recognize you guys one by one. If you guys could just come up one person at a time, come up and stand in the front so we can recognize you, and then um, you can go back to your seat and we'll recognize the next person. So our first recipient is Haley Pacto. Come on up, Haley. She attends really West Walk, um, and she is going to major in creative media. She's a sophomore, and then her parents are Margaret and Carol Pacto. Our second recipient is Aisha Ramones. Um, just have a representative from the Ramones family. She's not here right now, but she is attending Seattle Pacific University, so this is her sister. Um, she's a senior this year, so I think she's graduating this June, right? Um, and her major is in business management, and um, her parents are Uncle Edwin and Sylvia Ramones, and this is her sister, this is Sylvia Ramones. And then last but not least, we have Ian Pumani. He attends the University of Hawaii at Manol. He's a sophomore, and his major is mechanical engineering. And his parents um, is Uncle Ross and Auntie Florence Pumani. So always remember to put God first. Um, know that he's your strength. Um, and like what Pastor Han said, we might not know for certain where God is going to take us, but remember that we can do all things through Christ Jesus. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brittany, and the um, uh, Sharon Gramacho uh, Scholarship Committee. Uh, uh, well, well done. Uh, congratulations also to the recipients. Um, I'm, I'm sure you posted that you used the line when you produce. Oh, first of all, um, uh, the announcements. Um, we'd like to thank um, Pastor Nan Riddle. I mean, it says here for being our guest preacher, but it seems like he's been our preacher for 
<laughs> I don't hear your guests anymore. <laughs> They're part of the family. Okay. Um, there's nothing in the calendar events um, for today, but um, next Sunday, February 28th, uh, I'll put flowers. Um, um, I'm going to be given by Brittany Bashan Alamia for her birthday. And uh, worship leader will be Kathy Elsa of the Red Are there any other announcements that anybody wants to share? If not, um, let's um, stand for the uh, closing hymn uh, without my vision.